We are professionals. Like, this, is, this is a professional podcast. Yes. Breaking that and better for song. Hello there. <laughs> Which actually did you this get is me a hat a as bit, well? Um. Yes. So I've got Dune Cam. <laughs> it's just a camera <laughs> with my Dune Steelbook. Welcome back to the Quiet On Set podcast powered by Cinnamon. I'm Yuan, and today I'm joined by fellow film critic. Uh, maximum Cinema host and uh, facing the bit of truth offer, uh, Alan Mutley. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me yet again. Yes, it's been a tried and true statement of the shows. In, in a way, it's become that you've been on for the last three times we've covered uh, the ZFF and for the first time we're doing it with video. Welcome. <laughs> and uh, on today's show, we're going over the whole slate of uh, the program, um, all of the oh, 145 films or something like something that. Something like that. We're yeah. not going to go all of, <laughs> over all of those, of course, but uh, between the two of us, I think we watched about 75 films. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot to cover today. <laughs> More than half, so I think we've, we've exactly. done our bit. We've done very well, I'd say. Uh, so we'll go over section by section. Uh, if you want to skip around to anything specific that interests you, uh, there are time codes linked below for the sections and for the individual films as well. Uh, there's also the list that Alan and I made uh, individually for our um, ranked um, list for uh, all of the films that we watched at the ZFF. And um, before we jump in, I just wanted to, uh, maybe a bit of an introduction for people who don't know you yet. I think something that's really impressive that you are doing uh, later this year is uh, for the sight and sound you're doing at the top 100, you were selected as one of the critics. Could you maybe tell us a bit about that? How did, did that come to be? Uh, I actually have no idea how that came to be. Like, uh, I have been a long time subscriber to, uh, to sight and sound. Um, and I know some people who are regular contributors to sight and sound, but... Uh, yeah, I didn't think that I was like on the radar of sight and sound. But then uh, in July, I think I got an email that said, oh, hey, it's uh, the, the, the 10 year, uh, it's time for the 10 year top uh, best films of all time list of sight and sound. Yeah. And we would like you to contribute and just skim read the email. And I was like, oh, yeah, they're doing a reader's poll. So I'm going to be doing that. And then when I, I uh, when I actually sat down to to do it, I reread the email and I was like, no, wait, this doesn't say reader's poll. This is, this is a critic's poll. I have so, okay, so I don't know how I got here, but yeah. I don't know, maybe they were shopping around their own contributors for, hey, we want more people to contribute to the yeah. to the list. So might be that I just, that I ended up in that uh, selection. I mean, I saw that there were like 800 and something yeah. last time. Uh, that's already a lot of contributors, yeah. but still a small selection from film critics like as a whole. So congratulations on that. Could you leak one of the films that you put on the list? Uh, yes, I have a, a friend who is very um, disappointed in the lack of animated films in, right. the, in the list. So one of the films that I put on is uh, Hayao Miyazaki, Spirited Away. Okay, I'm, well, this is going to be a good hour that we have ahead of us. That's nice. No, wouldn't be okay. I don't want to. Maybe not my specific um, Miyazaki pick, but that mm -hmm. only speaks to uh, that th there should be more animation. I on mean, that obviously, list, right? But uh, well, yeah, a great film, great selection. Maybe it will make it on there. I would be pleased if if it does. But um, you and I also contributed to the Out Now Jury Grid, yeah. uh, which uh, looked at a bunch. Of, uh, I'll put it up here, uh, the final one. Um, but also there was a bunch of uh, the gala in the gala section, a bunch of films that were selected from there, and then a, a bigger focus on the focus section, which is uh, films that um, were produced or made in Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. Uh, Fourteen films in total, and we would told to, I guess, watch most of them. I don't know how much yeah. you did. Uh, I, I missed a few. I think I was missed five. Uh, maybe I'll get to a few of them uh, before the festival is over. We we're recording this on the last day of the festival. Yeah, Alan, what was, what was your highlight out of the focus section? Uh, I missed a bunch from the focus section. So uh, I think my highlight was probably either Rubicon, but that doesn't say that much because it's like a deeply like fine movie. So I, yeah. don't, I don't think I had like a major highlight in the focus section, right. but I also caveat, I didn't see that many of that section. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we were gearing towards maybe going more for the feature section yeah. right? and then kind of pivoted towards the focus. I tried to fit in as many as I could. Um, I missed the, the award win winner that won the mm -hmm. section, Stunt Women. Um, oh, I, I, that one I did see. And what did you think of that one? Uh, 
again, like it's fine, but it's like one of those one of those uh, documentaries, kind of documentaries that when you go to a few festivals, then you will have seen like you will see four or five of those every time. But it's yeah. you know it's it's uh, it's an interesting story about um, stunt women and their uh, and their lives and just for that, like it's an interesting watch. Yeah, I think th there were a couple of those typical festival yeah. films specifically in in this section. Yeah. There was one called The Water. I don't know if you got to I that didn't. one. Uh, it was very much like the environment tale and then weaving that into like generational stuff. It, it's very like beat by beat how mm -hmm. these stories play and then they have a bunch of he uh, head on shots yeah. documentary, which kind of took me out of the film. Wasn't a big fan of that one. Mm -hmm. um, to me, I think the highlight was uh, probably surprisingly Sacha Torte. Oh wow. <laughs> because, uh, well, at first it was blasphemy because he was name dropping um, before sunrise. Uh -huh. And I was like, well, this is basically uh, Marvel bait, but for <laughs> for film film lovers, the cinephiles, and it kind of had its own toll. Played it, I guess, by the books, but still had a lot of charm. And surprisingly, the, the product placement of the Sachote <laughs> wasn't terrible. It, it was kind of charming, and I was surprised that I actually liked it quite a bit. Uh, and yeah, uh, other than that, I don't know if there's if there's any other films that you would you would want to mention out of this section. I mean, not in a particularly kind way, but right. like uh, Patrick and the Whale yeah. uh, is. If you've seen my Octopus Teacher, you know what you know exactly what to expect. Yeah. Uh, but it's like one of the, I, I was talking to a friend yesterday, and uh, maybe one of the, my goals in life is now to recut Patrick and the Whale, take out all the interview sections, and blot out or just delete the voiceover, and just look at forty minutes of whale footage <laughs> and. Uh, have it be like an ambient thing that I go yeah. to sleep to, but yeah, other than that. I mean, it is, yeah. the, the footage is quite stunning. The footage is stunning, yeah. But again, it's like weaving a story into it. Sometimes just, it feels a bit off to, yeah. uh, because you, you're focusing overly on, on that like relationship between mm -hmm. those two. But I mean, the last one won an Oscar, so yeah. I, I don't think this is up there. It Probably also doesn't have enough. Netflix to back it yeah, up. And exactly. that was their front runner for the Netflix documentary that uh, Robert Downey Jr. is doing. On his on his father senior, it's probably gonna jump up in yeah. the Oscars just because it's Netflix. It's it's really they do have the power when it comes to those documentaries. There was another documentary, be uh, becoming Julia, uh, about a I guess well I guess locally here about, about a, a ballet dancer in in Zurich. Um, I mean it was just very much observing um, this person. I think I think it was nothing really special, but it won the the audience prize. Uh, maybe just because I guess it's it's not local. <laughs> maybe people were like. That's, that's cool. Uh, but one of the notable ones that I missed and that I've heard quite good things about, you probably missed it as well, Alpenland. Yeah, did that okay. one too. Yeah, same with Skin skin Deep. Uh, and uh, did you see uh, Thunder, Fudra? Uh, I did. Right. Uh, that was uh, one of the ones where I where I had a screener before the festival because I was uh, including it in a piece I wrote for Swiss Info. I admired the movie for uh, for its aesthetics. It's a very beautifully made movie, uh, but to my taste, it was a little bit for what it was. It was too short on story. Right. So it's like it felt like one of those movies that are ninety minutes long, but they have uh, material for maybe forty. Mm -hmm. So right. a lot of it, a lot of it felt protracted in a not very purposeful way for me, but uh, it still it uh, you know offers an, an interesting look at uh, Switzerland around the turn of the nineteenth uh, twentieth century and how it kind of negotiates female lust and sexuality and uh, basically frames those as uh, expressions of Christian morality and Christian belief. So that is interesting, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I wasn't that big of a fan of the ultimate like narrative execution. Well, speaking of things that are maybe don't have the material to go feature length, I think you also saw Holidays. Is that? Uh, I did not. Oh, you did not. That's the that's the Russian documentary. Yeah, I heard the, about that. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it follows just despicable characters mainly. <laughs> Great. You can't stand them. They're quite bigots. They're the they're racist. This mm. whatever. And I was like, ah, oh, I don't know if I need to see this. I guess it's like. A, a peek in uh, uh, behind the curtain in in a way but it also felt like it's not covering a whole year it felt rushed out because it's i guess topical right now and yeah. i think it's really recent of how far up it goes um mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, n nothing to write home about. I don't think you can skip out on that one. Um, another documentary. Did you catch Girl Gang? I did not. 
that's uh, the, the documentary that um, <laughs> Luca Bruno and I were debating if it's actually a documentary because it feels so forced in certain places. Mm -hmm. uh, I had an interview lined up with um, the director and then she said, well, anything that goes on YouTube, she's not partaking in. So I don't know, huh. I don't know what, okay. what the, I, I would have loved to interview, her, yeah. especially after that, like cameras all gone, <laughs> just a one-to-one -one interview. Um, but, but, but yeah, uh, that one was quite interesting just as I guess the, the day and age of the TikTok influences yeah. as they rise, and it's, it's about a 14-year-old girl and her parents who also become really involved in the business and make it a business. It's a bit about the exploitation, but less about, I guess, the parents, more about the system that exploits just young people, basically burns them out, but it never goes really deep. C could you talk a bit more about Rubicon? Because I think <laughs> people were very split on, on that one. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm very self-conscious about being put in the position of defending it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so... I mean, like, it's not a great movie by any stretch. Like, yeah. uh, the Austrian sci-fi that uh, mentions the word al algae, algae a whole lot. Um, but I think I was generally... The, the thing I was most taken with was that... Uh, and I hate to be this patronizing, but in this case, I think it's kind of warranted that given that it is like an Austrian sci-fi movie, it looks quite good. I was surprised that, it's, uh, that it really manages to put you in this, first of all, in this mindset of the dystopian future and then also like you much of or all of it is spent on a uh, on a space station and the space station has not the most exciting design in the world but it's like it works it's very functional it were uh, it uh, does the job i think and then uh it definitely runs out of story by the end because uh, there's a lot of repetitions in the third act do we go back do we not go yeah back? exactly yeah, it's, it's one story plot point i'm yeah. trying to find out how much uh, how big of a budget it has because i do agree yeah. it looks quite good for i assume probably not that big a budget yeah. and then i think what ultimately won me over was that even though, uh, as I said, it runs out of story by the end, uh, it didn't. It never actually started to bore me. I was right. because usually with these kinds of movies, I am very forgiving if they manage to hold my attention and that I am like reasonably invested. And here, I felt myself really being invested in. Okay, so do I want them to save those people down on Earth? Do I not want that? Yeah. And also, I don't know. Maybe that's a very basic opinion, but I just think Mark Ivanir to watch Mark Ivanir uh, in a supporting turn is always a lot of fun. Yeah, I think I think the performance is there as well. It's just it's just was the algae. It was just too <laughs> much algae. I, I, I couldn't deal with the algae. Uh, and also, I think it was I watched it on the day where I I had the biggest headache. I, I went into mm, the uh, festival being like really really quite sick, not actually knowing if I have COVID or not. <laughs> Turns out I I don't. I think. <laughs> I didn't, hopefully. I don't know if I, hopefully I didn't give anyone COVID. But I mean, I we sat next sick. to each other on the, on the first day. We did, and, and you were uh, fine. I, were, so. I am fine. fine and I so coughed far, in your so. face, so that's the <laughs> No. Uh, Wait, what? That was when I was asleep. <laughs> <laughs> it was during GT and Nate, which we'll get, later. <laughs> we'll get to it later, just briefly, I guess. But no, um, and I just had to, this was later on in the festival, but I just had a very off day that morning and I actually had to leave after that screening. I, I went home and was like, no, I've got to cut it after two films that yeah. day. Uh, so maybe I don't have the best impression of me being, um, indulging this movie, yeah. uh, but but still, I, I was a bit under underwhelmed by, by the story beats as they were repeated and yeah. maybe I wasn't as patient with it. I mean, I'm not saying it's the it's a very smart or deep movie. But, but I again, haven't. I mean, the focus is to focus on, I guess, more local productions. Yeah, yeah. And it's harder to stand out than, I guess, when the global selection Definitely. is here when it's just from three countries. So exactly. still the selection, I think, isn't isn't bad at all. Yeah. Uh, last two films, uh, then we'll move on. Uh, Vamos a la, Playa, a la Playa, did you? Agree? I did not see it, but I heard very bad things about it. It was, it was, it was a funny, <laughs> funny film. <laughs> so, so I'll say it's just, it was, it was um, young people uh, traveling around and finding someone and it's just this loose plot of them going off in separate groups and then the struggles uh, that they have facing with their, with the identity coming to terms with it. But uh, it's, uh, at the end of the day, I think it was it was quite quite bland. Um, didn't really take anything away from it. And the last film that um, maybe neither of us caught uh, the ordinaries. The ordinaries. Uh, no, but I again I heard different different things about it. Yeah. And the the what I heard about the plot really made me uh, interested. But ultimately, I wasn't able to catch it. All right, feature section. Uh, there's one film that I think got really overlooked by the awards section. Maybe uh, we can mention up front. Uh, 
neither of us saw the kings of the world, the, the winner of uh, no. the feature section. Kicking myself from uh, Friday a week ago. <laughs> yeah, for, for me, it was, I, I nearly caught everything in the gala section. I think I missed like seven of the 36 films. But I did miss a bunch from the documentary and feature section. Mm. But I think our, our highlight is uh, both both of our highlight is After Sun, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So After Sun is one of those movies where I feel going into it, I felt okay. So this is a story about a girl and her divorced dad, and they're on uh, they're on holiday. And I was like, okay, so right, where is the trauma hidden? Where is the <laughs> Uh, where is the overcrank tragedy? And then as the movie progressed, uh, it became more and more clear that, oh, this is not going to be one of those movies. It's just going to be a very gentle, very empathetic portrait of a daughter and her dad who are both at a crossroads in life. And I found it really moving. And yeah. uh, it's definitely one of the big highlights and the big uh, revelations of this festival to me. Yeah, it's such a observational piece yeah. in a sense. And it really feels like it's not just a film. It's, it really is like art. It depicts mm. that type of feeling of um, going on, on, on a holiday. <laughs> I don't know, I saw a bunch of little things that I resonated with that mm -hmm. I could attach to. But it wasn't in a way where it like hits you over the head with yeah. its themes. It's so subtle and, and like you said, uh, it's um, well, I guess it's really tender with how it approaches that. So it's just a really beautiful film. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's I think it, it definitely is like a critics film. I think so. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be interested to see how the general audience responds to it just because it is very slow. But um uh, Paul Mescal is his name, right? Yeah. He's, he's, he's incredible. He is great. I think God's uh, God's Creatures just came out on VOD. I'm going to dip into that as soon as we're done with this recording. <laughs> just released, I think, in the States on VOD. So, uh, yeah, just um, him on the rise. I think he's yeah. going to be an actor around to stay. He brings uh, so much nuance. And, and her performance with the girl... Mm. Um, Again, another another great, um, uh, I guess, kid performance, which we, we don't get too often. So yeah. Yeah, really notable there. And then, um, yeah, you caught Blue Jean. Uh, yes, right? just uh, just last night. Not quite on the level of After Sun, but still really strong. Uh, first of all, it really helps that the film is uh, shot on 16 millimeters, so it, yeah. uh, it really looks gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, story of a, a gym teacher in the north of England in the 1980s uh, battling with uh, a crackdown on the, of the uh, Thatcher government on uh, schools and local councils, quote unquote, promoting homosexuality, which, uh, of course, rings very, very relevant uh, at the moment, if we see what's for, uh, happening, for example, in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the I, I think I'm most into the aesthetics in the movie, but I also I also think it's a uh, quite a fascinating portrait of a um, of a difficult main character because yeah. she, even though she uh, she is a lesbian, she is in a lot of ways she is closeted and actively by her inaction works against uh, the advancement of uh, other people in her position. And yet, it's still a very empathetic portrait of uh, why she does what she does and how she tries to break out of that role. And I thought that was very well done. Yeah, couldn't have said it. That's in, in exactly my thoughts as well. Also, yeah, visually, I think the, the 60 millimeter choice is, is, is a great one. Yeah. Um, and then uh, one that did, that uh, between the two sa satires, the big satires at the film, or I guess the one big satire, the one, the Palm Door, Triangle of Sadness, and uh, fucking Bornholm, uh, you got a favorite, right? I mean, again, or, favorite is a big word, but yes, it's fucking born. It's home. Rubicon again. <laughs> yes. Defend it. <laughs> Rubicon, best satire of the year, best sci-fi movie of the year, best comedy of the year, best algae of the year. No. Of the year. Um, so yeah, fucking born home. It's, uh, I think it's one, uh, one of those movies that, um, I think I described it to someone else from the Maximum Cinema podcast as it's the most um, three out of five movie you'll ever see. Right. Yeah, it's, you know, it's your usual uh, two couples with their kids go on uh, vacation. Mm -hmm. uh, they're from Poland. They go to Bornholm in Denmark and uh, things go awry. And it's pretty much what you expect from that premise. But uh, it has the uh, it has the benefit of director and writer uh, Anna Kazayak being quite good with uh, comedic and darkly darkly humorous dialogue. So it is quite funny, even if it hits the, the usual story beats. And right. At just about, I think, 90 or 95 minutes, it doesn't out, uh, overstay its welcome, which uh, with Ruben Östlin, on the other hand, is usually what happens with me. <laughs> well, we'll get to that a bit later. Uh, any, well, I guess I got a couple more that I 
saw out of this section. I don't know if you saw the Cake Dynasty. I did not, but I heard uh, wild things about yeah, it. Yeah, it's a very weird movie, and I, I, I have no thoughts of it. I, I don't, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened for those ninety minutes or whatever uh, that I watched it. Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was weird. I think it's also the satire when you first posted. I think you tweeted something about like the best time, and I thought you were talking about this. Yeah. And I was like, oh no, I guess he's talking about the other <laughs> film. That it's, like I don't know if this is supposed to be satirical. If what exactly the, the vibe is here. Uh, but I mean, it, it is entertaining, but it's also a bit disturbing and odd. Um, but sounds very Danish. It is. <laughs> I think it is very Danish. <laughs> uh, not sure about Un Unruly if that's also a Danish film or if that's. Uh, I'd actually have to check real quick. But that's, I, yeah, I th it's either Danish or Norwegian. I have not seen it, but uh, there. It is. It is Danish. Yeah, it is Danish. Uh, but um, that was the one that uh, there was a film that I found a bit uh, disappointing because it. It really goes into that, uh, making the, the suffering the main point mm. of um, the film. And obviously, it's real, obviously, like, you know, there, there is real suffering, but making it the focus of, of the film just over and over and over again uh, felt a bit redundant and, and a bit reductive for, I guess, approaching it. But uh, again, then this institution that um, well, uh, took... Uh, people who who stuck out uh, of the system who were who was uh, sexual in any kind of way get them to I guess reform. Um, I mean those were dark times and they, they happened all over the world in, in those institutions. But it, it's just it's just a very heavy movie. Yeah. And for the entire runtime of the film, I had a couple next to me that he came in with like a big beer <laughs> and then she said uh, the, his wife said next to me directly next to me and was uh, kept. Uh, emoting to everything that was happening oh, yeah. she went like in the most swiss way she went oh nice <laughs> <laughs> and like everything that happened so <laughs> that was my experience with fucking born home like uh it is a funny movie but like there was the, the first 20 minutes it was like there's an awkward silence right cinema breaks out in riotous laughter and i'm sitting there like calm down it's just you know <laughs> well we haven't talked about mad hot yet i think you didn't catch me i Heidi. didn't catch Heidi, i yeah. went to the premiere that was one of the the craziest cinema experiences oh, wow. in a long time <laughs> but uh war pony did you catch that one? i did catch uh, did catch that one yeah. um one of those movies that uh is Decent enough, but could be much better. So it uh, tells the story of uh, basically modern reservation life in, I think, South Dakota. And it, uh, it uh, focuses on two characters who don't really meet until the end of the movie. And the two narrative foci, they don't really speak to each other that much. And I think one of the, the probably the main, main character uh, gets too many conflicts where the conflicts are just sort of samey so like oh right. he his he has trouble with his girlfriend and he also has trouble with his ex-girlfriend yeah. and uh, he has also has trouble with another woman and it's yeah. uh, a little bit of a little bit of a repetitive movie but uh it's you know i guess it's fun enough i don't really mind it that much yeah it's very much the dramatized daily life yeah of, exactly of, some, of um someone living in that community that i guess gets gets a bit emphasized in, in this, but I also agree. I agree is it was a bit repetitive. Um, it's, it's certainly, I think that that's, it, it also premiered at Gunn. It was one of the fil uh, films that I missed in Gunn, um, but a lot of, uh, in the section, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, I'll put it on screen right now. Uh, but overall, uh, in that section, um, a lot of the films were like about two hours long, mm -hmm. and a lot of them were, were a bit too long. Um, yeah, yeah, same so, same with War Pony. So like, and yeah, it's not getting the bottle recut, which which won't <laughs> save that movie, by the way. But uh, I think one movie that I didn't catch that you caught until tomorrow. Yes, that was uh, that was really good. Uh, also saw that yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was a good day for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, until tomorrow. Uh, it. I mean, it's very much in the style of what of what uh, you think of when you think of like contemporary Iranian social drama. So it's very much in the Ashkar Farhadi. Uh, tradition uh, it's about a woman who lives in Tehran on her own she has a baby and then out of the blue her parents uh, call her and they're like hey can we stay can we stay over at yours tonight because mm -hmm. we have business in the city and then the, f the film tells the story of her trying to uh, find a place where she can uh, 
keep her baby overnight so that her parents won't find out that she is a mother. Right. And it's uh, the movie or the, the viewing experience this reminded me most of is Uncut Gems because it's really like trying to uh, trying to find your way out of a tight spot and mm. just like seeing option after option just uh, turning out to not be feasible. Right. And then every time you think, oh, now she's done it, it's like she gets another phone call. And it's like, no, it doesn't work out after all. And uh, on the, on the one hand, it can seem a bit like a screenwriting exercise at time, but I also, it's very grounded, it's very, like, rooted in the everyday, and it really is, a, I think, a great illustration, uh, or it feels like a great illustration of all these social and religious and legal pressures uh, that are on uh, Iranian women all the time, and that... Uh, in this movie, really, at every moment, threaten to just come crashing down on the protagonist. And at 85 minutes, that's just the perfect format and the perfect uh, length and pace for a, for a story like this. And I really, really enjoyed it. Well, I think the, the jury, which I think Oscar Fahadi is also the, yeah. the, the president of, or like the, the leader of the jury. In the feature section, I gave it a, a special shout out. Mm. Uh, and I'm blanking on what other movie got the special shout out. But uh, there was one one more, I think. But uh, there's a couple films that I uh, missed. I don't know if you caught any of those. So I'll, I'll list them and you can yep. tell me if you have. Uh, Return to Soul. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Sairi. I'm not entirely sure. I did not catch that. Something You Said Last Night and Cork. What's the last one? Cork. How do you spell that? Uh, just like cork, C O R K. Huh. I, I completely not, missed that. One. I have no. <laughs> Asuro I, is is what it's called. Uh, no, also not. So right. no, I've seen uh, I've seen Return to Soul, and I'm yeah. going to see something I said last night later today. But right. as of now, I have no thoughts on that one yet. Obviously, yeah. Return to Soul um, again uh, could be disappointing because it could be much better. So uh, it's uh, the story of a, uh, of a French woman who uh, was born in South Korea and was then adopted by a French couple when she was a baby. Uh, and she goes back to South Korea for the, uh, for the first time and she tries to find her uh, biological parents. And that is about maybe half of the movie, maybe a bit less of, uh, than half of the movie. And that uh, is, you know, your re pretty regular fish out of water story. Yeah. Uh, that is quite empathetically done that's fine but then afterwards there are two time jumps and then the movie kind of loses control of its characters and it just goes off in directions that are interesting i'm going to give it that but that don't really follow from uh, from the characters as we've been introduced yeah. uh, as we've been yeah as we've uh, met them so it's uh, yeah, it's probably a bit over ambitious in where it goes with its uh, with its very simple story. Right, interesting. And then uh, one film I almost skipped over, which I would after seeing it, I would describe as probably the inferior version of uh, Until Tomorrow. Uh, Valeria is getting uh, married. Okay. Um, also seeing that today, so I'm uh, oh, very right. very that's, excited. It's also on the the video platform, by the way. If you miss it. Yeah, but my my mom wants to wanted to go see oh, another movie this afternoon, and this well, one was the one that fit the schedule. But I, I think I think it's <laughs> it's a film that is very very simple. Uh, it mm -hmm. feels like that kind of um, one location no. film uh, where it is all about a system that you get a peek into uh, through what what someone experiences uh, being kind of married off uh, into a different country and maybe not wanting to do that. And uh, uh, going through this, the, I guess, subtle reasons why, why you obviously don't want to do that if you want to meet the person the first time you, you see them. And then those arranged marriages that are basically, I guess, back in um, going back in time for what marriages were for, just for... Mm. I guess, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, being located <laughs> with someone who's, who's a bit better off or can provide safety. Uh, I, I think it was a bit underwhelming because it, it is really simple in what it's doing. Um, so it might work better in, in a short form in like a 30 minute thing. Um, but still, I found it um, I found it engaging. And it's I think it also isn't too long. I think it's like about 90 minutes. 
Uh, but that's the, that's the feature section. Now moving to the embarrassed, to me, very embarrassing documentary section where I only caught one film. Well, what was what was the documentary that, or the one of the documentaries that you saw? That uh, was... I saw All That Breathes. Yeah. Uh, which I really enjoyed. Again, it's a very uh, it's very much a, a documentary that you would see at a festival, mm -hmm. but it was one of those that really used the format well. So it's about uh, three brothers in Delhi, one of the most polluted cities in, on the planet it who have dedicated their lives to saving uh, and looking after the local bird population, specifically the kites. Uh, and basically they treat kites that are grounded because they're injured or that just fall out of the sky because uh, the air is so polluted. And mm. it uh, doesn't sound like much, but um, they also the film also ties this to uh, the current political situation in India because the three protagonists are Muslims. Yeah. And uh, there is this very anti muslim Muslim uh, rhetoric and politics and violence in uh, India right now, also during the film. So right. anti-Muslim riots um, and basically pogroms are uh, part of the film. And they, the movie really uh, deftly links their animal rights activism or their um, saving of the animals or of the birds. Uh, very deftly links that to we must uh, be mindful of all other creatures and that includes uh fellow uh, fellow people so i think it really um uh, it really does well on that score and it's beautifully photographed so you get a lot of very intricate shots uh, also with uh, different uh, different foci and also like super detailed close-ups of insects and things mm -hmm. so it also just re it looks really beautiful and no narrator that feels like he needs to connect himself to these animals. Too there much. is, I mean, there is a voiceover, but it comes up like four times. It right. can, and it's one of the brothers. It can seem a little distracting. So that's probably the film's biggest weakness. But oh, right. uh, like in, in an eighty-five minute movie, if you have like four portions where there's voiceover, it's just like yeah, yeah we, we'll we'll roll with it. Well, for me, the only thing I caught was Sam. Now <laughs> I didn't even see it at the festival. I got a screener from the directors, uh, did an interview with the director and the producer uh, that uh, I'll link to right here. But um, to me, this was a, a very Im impressive uh, documentary. Maybe I'm a bit biased because I also met them now and they were super charming. Um, it does hit, this, uh, hit kind of the same bits because it is about uh, an older brother documentary, uh, doc uh, documenting his, his younger brother who's eight years younger than him. Um, from uh, who, who has a different mother that mother abandons them uh quite uh, early on without saying anything so the movie becomes uh very much just a, a a film about observing your little brother and maybe making a narrative out of that and uh they they both were people who were doing sh uh, short films um as they were young as well there's a bunch of sequences that they put in that I thought were remade just because they they worked so well for for being done by teenagers uh very impressive stuff so he has a lot of material and then it becomes very much about dealing and growing up and it spans over 25 years goes through different formats from I think Super 8 to a whole bunch of um yeah uh, even to digital and camcorders there's a whole bunch of uh different uh, looks that you get in the film and it's it's quite creatively told uh, doesn't overstay its welcome. Again, the, the beat of the, the mother may be a bit repeated uh, much because I think ultimately it doesn't hold that much in that story, uh, but it, it really is interesting and it won um, the, the jury prize. We can go through and maybe see if, if one of those films either of us also caught. There's a, the other whale film, uh, A Taste of Whale, uh, a provincial hospital, um, Blue Island, um, Cowboy Poets, Day After, Eternal Spring. I saw Eternal Spring, but you just went through so, uh, so many titles. I was like, oh yeah, I almost caught that, and yeah. then uh, it got the, it got short shrift uh, in favor of another of another movie. Yeah, I mean, we have the possibility to still see a bunch yeah, of films, true. and uh, especially the documentaries are yeah. on that platform for the critics. So we we probably end mm. up catching these still. Yeah. But I guess they're not a priority, right? Yeah. When, over the other uh, films, unfortunately. But yeah, Eternal uh, Spring. Eternal Spring. Uh, very. Um, striking story it uh, tells the story of uh, a group of uh, falun gong practitioners from china who were in one way or another uh, involved in the hijacking of uh, the state tv station in china in 2002 after the the movement had been uh, banned and practitioners were brutally persecuted 
Uh, and there was a lot of propaganda swirling around uh, through the state media that Falun Gong is, uh, is bad for families, that, uh, pe that it's just an, an evil in society. Yeah. And then they hijacked the TV station to basically correct the record and to say, no, Falun Gong is, this, uh, is rooted in Buddhism. These are the tenets. Uh, and as I said, it's a very striking, very relevant, very important story about anti-religious uh, persecution in China. But where it ultimately falls down for me is the execution, because uh, the basically the main character is a is a comic artist, and that is fair enough. Like if you want to do an animated documentary, then and your ma your main character or your main protagonist is a is a comic artist, that makes perfect sense. However, the movie is not really made in a comic style but more of a like video game telltale point and click adventure style right and that really distracts from from the story because it's also characters are introduced like they would be in like a quirky uh, a quirky indie game or something and it feels really jarring to uh, to put that story side by side with those very video game visuals and also like a pre or a credits a credit sequence that looks straight out of gta as well right okay so it's uh the the style really hurts the substance in that case katrina babies is a film that i also had on my schedule i even had a ticket i had to cancel it happens so much this festival it usually doesn't but um i mean i've, I've heard some good things i heard about good it. things about it hurt okay things about it yeah. so i would be interested in still seeing it also because i'm quite interested in like new orleans after katrina mm. And uh, my old school. Oh, I have seen right? that. It's, it's, this is such a high, comparatively high profile movie. I keep thinking that it's like a special screening or a yeah. gala premiere. But uh, well, yeah, talk about the movie where the substance is, uh, is hurt by the style. Um, so it's, uh, I'm not going to say too much about it because it's one of those movies where um, it's best if you just go in knowing nothing and then having uh, basically the movie lift the lid off. Even though the movie undercuts itself in that a little bit, because what it talks about, I guess, made uh, a lot of headlines in the early 2000s in the UK. Yeah. Um, so there is a prologue to the movie that basically gives away the game, which I thought was a bit of a shame. But generally, it's just about uh, a person uh, uh, looking back at uh, how he um, how he was a uh, student at high school mm -hmm. and how that was. Um, an unusual story, let's put it that way. Right. And again, the story is great. It's narrated by a lot of very affable Glaswegians who are very Scottish and very Glaswegian in every in everything they do and how they yeah. how they talk and how they remember things. So that was very fun. What is less fun is that speaking of movies that look like video games, it looks like a very a lot of it looks like a very cheap like browser game that you would right. play about like Dora the Explorer or uh -huh. something. It's just. Uh, yeah, again, like if you want to use animation, that is fair enough. But here the animation is just very, very cheap and it doesn't it doesn't really add anything. Well, interesting. I, I mean, I've I think that one premiered all the way at Sundance. Yeah, it could be. Know, yeah. But I, I, I missed it there as well. Uh, there's there's four more films that I think both of us missed. Uh, Hide and Seek. Um, didn't hear anything about that one. Same. The Killing of a Journalist. Um, I heard think that got a special mention. Yeah, and I think I heard some people say good things about it. Uh, the Mission, um, which I'll still catch because it is on that platform, but I also um, didn't catch that one. And uh, uh, The New Greatness Case. I don't know if that's a translation thing. <laughs> it's No, it is The no, New I Greatness think, yeah, Case. Okay. I, I almost went to see that on Thursday night, but that was before I knew that uh, Press Pass uh, also gets you gala premiere tickets. So uh, really, it does. So yeah. So oh, I um, thought that was actually oh, okay, okay. Good to know. <laughs> so uh, I went. Me. So I went to see the menu instead. Right. Okay. Well, I'll keep. Uh, I, I mean, I saw twenty nine of the thirty six films. I, I think I didn't miss out on the gala things, the gala screenings, but still, I didn't know that. Uh, but yeah, that's that's it for for the documentary section. Um, I think let's let's kick in and actually get into uh, the just mentioned special uh, section at the festival. First up, I also missed a, a bunch of films over here, but maybe let's kick it off with the film that recently won the Golden Lion uh, over in Venice, uh, being I think the second or the third, I think the, the second documentary to ever win it. Uh, All the beauty and the bloodshed. Yes. Did you catch that one? I did catch it. Yes. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised, very pleasantly surprised, because I'd previously, I think I've only seen Citizen Four by the director, Laura Poitras. 
and I was a bit underwhelmed by Citizen 4. Um, and then I went into all the beauty and the bloodshed. And I was really blown away because uh, it's a more traditional style documentary than something like Citizen 4. So you, I guess you could fault it for that. But it makes up for it in uh, a great protagonist and yeah. uh, really good presentation of or juxtaposition of the two things it talks about so on the one hand uh you have well at the center of the movie there's uh, nan golden the photography artist and on the one hand the film talks about her activism against the sackler family who were basically responsible for the opioid crisis and how their name is on a bunch of uh, museum wings and art collections because they're style themselves patrons of the arts uh so her activism to uh is to uh take the sackler name off um these museum wings and art collections uh and then on the other hand uh the film also reconstructs her um basically her formative years from uh her birth and through the 1970s and 1980s in new york uh in the the queer scene uh of new york at that time and also with the advent of the aids crisis how um how a lot of her friends and her fellow activists died during that time and i think uh Without really hammering you over the head with it, the film uh, constructs this parallel uh, narrative that um, you have the AIDS epidemic uh, in the 80s and 90s and you have the op opioid e epidemic in the 2010s mm -hmm. and how both of these are kind of uh, expressions of a politics of disinterest and how uh, people are basically left to die because there is no political incentive to uh to help them and i thought that was really well done yeah i i agree that i think the 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 thing that um i guess is the biggest critique point coming out of it is that it is those two storylines that it goes back and forth to and to me that was at times a bit jarring and sometimes mm -hmm. i wanted to stay especially in like going back and looking yeah. at her life i think that was so incredibly interesting it also yeah. spanned i guess over a greater period of time True. and she's she's such an interesting person so to much, follow. Yeah. so it's like i guess a retrospective on what she what she has done and what she's doing right now and that's that's how kind of how i saw it but thematically as well i think it, it is that repeated oppression that she kind of fights against the systemical things that uh that yeah of, of, of ignorance and um disinterest and so i i think overall it's a uh, it's it's uh it's surprising to me still that it won um yeah. something like the the um golden lion in venice but um, yeah, I think it's it's certainly a documentary that, that that's pretty much a must watch. I think yes, this year, absolutely. It's, it's a very solid film. And in a film, I think you also just caught yesterday, Crimes of the Future. Oh hell yeah! <laughs> I had a great time. I've been looking forward yes. to Crimes of the Future for uh, months or whenever the first trailer or. No, I mean, when it was first uh, uh, announced, but then the first trailer came out early this year and yeah. uh, somebody posted it in the Maximum Cinema chat and people were like, ew, what is this? And I was just like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the great return of David Cronenberg after, yeah. I think, eight years um, away from, from cinema screens. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, yeah, I... I really love the movie. It's uh, unapologetically heady. It doesn't ingratiate itself with its audience. It's just uh, basically transhumanist art theory uh, with a bit of uh, tax incentive uh, location shooting in Greece. Oh. Um, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, it's just, it, it, it really works through a lot of the obsessions that Cronenberg has uh, been toying with over the course of his, at this point, almost 50 year career. Yeah. It's confounding it's uh, uh difficult in many ways it's also really funny i thought um kristen stewart gives a great over-the-top performance uh and yeah i'm still i'm still processing it but i already can't wait to watch it again and also great another great uh, musical score from uh, from howard shore right I think I think we probably don't share the same opinion on this. I, I didn't really like it. Uh, I, I I just I don't know. I, I think it, there's not much to say other than uh, if you uh, are in for the style that he creates and the world that mm. he creates, then it's a bit easier to follow. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. if you don't care as much about yeah. the plot, because I think that kind of fizzles into a bit of nothingness. Yeah. yeah. Which you could also also attribute to like that's intentional. I don't know. I just I, I didn't really vibe with it as much. Uh so it wasn't really yeah. high on my list. Uh I, I read somewhere that in a QA uh he said that 
uh, introducing the movie, he said, uh, you will get it after the first 10 minutes and afterwards you're free to leave. <laughs> yeah, that was the thing about like so many people left this film. Mm. I was in Cannes where that hap was happening. Uh -huh. There were not that many people leaving. There were more people leaving for other films. Huh. There, yeah, so there more, I think there were more people leaving for 3,000 Days of Longing. Uh, uh, than, wow. But, but yeah. Uh, anyways, <laughs> something that no one left, uh, a really <laughs> special Swiss tale of filmmaking. Um, in here is also Heidi from 1952. But then the new film, um, independently produced uh, with a $2 million budget, fan-founded uh, Mad Heidi, a Swiss exploitation film. And I, well, that's the company that does it. And uh, yeah, it was at the, at the premiere, um, which had a, a whole bunch of people who were supporters for this film for, for years, I think five or seven years. This film has been in production. Um, and uh, it's it's impressive for Swiss filmmaking to okay. see it. Uh, I I think I'm kind of trying to give it a, better, a higher rating than it actually would deserve if I would like be more a bit objective than subjective but i mean film rating is always subjective but uh it's it's entertaining but it, it has like an aesthetic where it uh constantly cuts into the frame in the same thing and it also has a bunch of um editing stuff that is a bit amateurish which is fine if it's a fan produced film and a fan film but it is also trying to usher in a new era for yeah. swiss Filmmaking, and I think it's th they're overshooting maybe a bit in its ambition of what it actually can achieve. But when it comes to fan service on a level of, of fan founding a film and then providing that service, I think they had, had a blast. They absolutely had a huge success at that screening. Um, I haven't checked with the other two screenings that it had after that, where it wasn't... Apparently the one yesterday that I didn't go to because I thought it was sold out, they had ticketing problems. So a friend of mine who went uh, said the cinema is basically empty because nobody was able to book tickets and they're really? giving away seats for free. Uh, oh, wow. But unfortunately, I was already basically uh, in front of my front door like three minutes before the movie uh, uh, was supposed to start. So yeah. I couldn't make it back down to, to Corsa to catch it. Well, that's, that's, that's a, a shame. Yeah. yeah, that is a shame because, um, well, it is getting a release, I think, in, in November. November yeah. And then uh, it will be available online. And I think it is something that uh, I think it's worth celebrating, even if yeah. you don't, because it, it, it serves a, a niche community. And it's genre film that we never get. We in Swiss films, it's a lot of period pieces, yeah. a lot of money of the I think the 86 million that we have in total for budgeting that is given to Swiss filmmakers. You know, it, it ends up being uh, a, a Bruno Manzo or whatever. It ends like that type of film, yeah. which doesn't add anything to it. And at least here we can say it's really something new if you like it or not. But uh, so Mad Heidi, I think just if you want, a, I mean, they described it as a, a trashy B movie mm. themselves. Uh, after the film in the Q&A. Uh, so it, it is fully self-aware. I don't know if it works at all times, but it also doesn't have to. If it's a trash B-movie, you can just enjoy it. Um, but <laughs> enough of Mad Heidi. I also did an interview, a link, uh, two interviews, I'll link to those here as well. And then um, Speak No Evil, which is something I think you didn't really enjoy, right? It, yeah, because... Um, I, I saw someone, uh, someone describe this movie as... It's one of those movies where you go, yes... I get it. It's fine. Yeah, uh, it's. Um, I mean, again, that that's probably where my adage that everybody trying to do Ruben Östlund is better at it than Östlund himself. I think this yeah. one might just be the case where that's not the case. Yeah, uh, it's uh, basically a Danish couple who uh, meets a Dutch couple on a vacation in Italy, and then the the Dutch couple invites the Danish couple for a weekend, and then things go awry from there. The the way people describe this movie to me, I thought it would be like. Don't get me wrong, it is very violent, yeah. but it, I think it was more prominently violent yeah, and yeah, not yeah. just like, you know, almost, you know, just kind yeah. of an end tag. Uh, to me, it was uh, a bit underwhelming because I was yeah. like, okay, when, when is it coming? I guess it's psychologically a bit like it's, tense. Yeah, I guess. But it also goes like from zero to 100. Yeah. The characters don't really so make, much. make sense. Yeah. And then in the end, I feel the, the, the finale doesn't really add that much because it already basically shows you what the whole what the whole plot or the whole story behind the thing is yeah and then the end basically just reiterates that just for those people go through all the notions yeah. to yeah exactly to and get then that. it's uh, yeah so so what <laughs> so that's i think that's the that's that was my initial reaction when i got it. I was like okay so what i think the the last film um 
last year when we came out of the souvenir part two, mm -hmm. I, I was I was raving and, and I was like, yeah, that's a great film. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of okay. And now we got the new film from uh -huh. Joanna Hoag, uh, The Eternal Daughter. Did you manage to, to, to fit that one into your schedule? Yes, I did. Yeah? And uh, it's funny because that is a movie that probably only really makes sense if you've seen the two souvenirs because uh, Tilda Swinton plays basically plays the character that her daughter plays in uh, in the two souvenirs uh, has the same name and she also still plays the character's mother so, so we get two Tilda Swintons in this movie yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think I ended up liking it a little better than uh, than the souvenir movies because mm -hmm. I mean it is a very meta film but it's yeah. not not really in your face about how meta it is and i like even apart from that i just enjoyed that it was like an old-timey uh 1950s ghost story mm -hmm. uh so like if you put i don't know robert wise is the haunting uh in color and uh switched out all the all the actors with tilda swinton that's probably the uh the movie you would get and uh i had a i had a good time it's it's like it's not a masterpiece, I would say, because it does end up doing probably a little bit too little with uh, with what it has or what what it's what is going on on the story and emotional level. Right. But uh, no, as like a small scale uh, artsy ghost story, I had a good time. For me, I think I was a bit underwhelmed by it, but I think it's really easy to be underwhelmed by one oh, of the films yeah. because they are so. So we, uh, I think they're quite subtle in what mm -hmm. they're doing. I think the souvenir part too is is very much uh, a bit more, uh, I guess, uh, easier to digest with yeah. its themes because it's just about the film production. Mm -hmm. And here, it's really can you indulge uh, Tilda Swinton talking to herself um, for for like ninety minutes or however long the film is. And to me, it it, it didn't really um, emotionally engage me, so it was quite quite. Uh, bored e early on in, and then I, I I was a bit underwhelmed by it. Uh, so for me, the super <laughs> films are still still up top there. Uh, I am going to watch more Joanna Hawk, so that's uh, that's yeah, uh, definitely. I think she she's a she's a um, great up and coming filmmaker. Nuclear, not seen. Oliver Stone. I, well, I wouldn't have seen it at ZFF as well. I, I saw it in Venice, and it actually made me rethink nuclear nuclear power. Although it is more like a a overproduced uh, YouTube video than an actual documentary. It's very much Oliver Stone coming in and saying um, and telling you directly, yeah, look at all those dumb people who don't get that nuclear is actually not that dangerous. And it's like him honing that point in. Um, it, it's very much just an argument for this. This would be good. <laughs> Let's do that. It would actually help us. And it made some great points. Um, and I, I found it really enlightening uh, as someone who who is not really in. Uh, I guess that up to date with what's the the latest in energy tech. Uh, the argument for nuclear energy was made here um, quite well. Uh, it was it was done quite well. <laughs> Although again, it feels like a YouTube video. <laughs> uh, I have to I have to say I have not uh, watched the video, but uh, one of the more compelling cases uh, that has nothing to do with the dangers of uh, um, of nuclear power is the the fact that you will have to build them somewhere and there will be massive massive resistance from the places where you would build them so that yeah. the political hurdles are probably too big and it's also i think in, in especially central europe it's yeah. it's it's done yeah <laughs> for for at least like the next few years i don't think anything's happening yeah. uh there which yeah if, if you go by his argument is kind of disappointing because oh, I, again that's it's like it's very, oliver stone so it's it is oliver stone so. <laughs> It's also, or, it obviously it's welcome about like half an hour. Yeah, as as my as my dad always refers to him as Oliver. There's a conspiracy stone. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, we both caught Rimini. We um, did. I, I, another film where I was I wasn't sure what to think about it while I was watching it because I I went from oh this movie sucks I hate this character I can't stand it but it's like well that's actually the point you're supposed to observe it it's like well it's repetitive it goes back to the same point and it feels like it's reiterating the same thing mm. well that's the point we're supposed to <laughs> be annoyed with him going back and forth but it's doing it too much but no what did you make of it uh I realized while I was, what I was watching the movie or after I've uh, I've watched it uh I actually haven't seen as much Ulrich Seidel as I thought I had I think I only saw his Paradise trilogy before that mm -hmm. um but I have sort of an idea of what he's about and I feel um Rimini is kind of very much a late work in that it picks up things that 
uh, that have been swirling around his filmography all his career. Mm-hmm. Um, not deploying them that purposefully, but I think uh, what he what he does in Rimini, it's still like it still intrigued me uh, quite uh, quite a bit. So just uh, just the very premise of like a uh, um, a, croon, a crooner who uh, has to somehow get through the the tough winter months in Rimini and uh, play to very unenthu- fairly unenthusiastic crowds of elderly Austrians. Yeah. Uh, it's just like it's a great image. It's a uh, uh, it makes for a great mood. I agree that it's too long and it kind of fizzles out by the end, and there's a lot of repetition in it. But I think uh, it is both intriguing enough, and it just has this very caustic sort of mean spirited uh, side yeah. uh, atmosphere <laughs> that I understand anyone. I can understand anyone who can't uh, who can't connect with that. But here, I thought it was uh, it was quite effective. I think it was very effective, which made it so so uh, so heavy at yeah, times, yeah. you know. But yeah, I think it succeeded there. Uh, then, other than that, I mean, Avatar I was also playing in that section. I didn't rewatch Avatar. Didn't rewatch it, but, but I did uh, check out the in, in the festival center. They did have those the cars right there, uh, sponsored by I don't know what car company, but a car Mercedes. Car maybe? I think I'm, probably yeah. Mercedes. I think they're sponsor of some of them. Well, shout out to you, Mercedes. Uh, then the unredacted is. Uh, yes. Oh, I've you saw that, that one. one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Again, I'm quoting a lots, a lots of friends of mine. Somebody said, there's a good film in there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, originally, I think it uh, it premiered in Sundance under the title Jihad Rehab. Yeah. Uh, which is probably the better title. Uh, but I don't really know what happened behind the scenes. And also the filmmaker has very strong opinions about people wanting to silence her or her movie. Mm-hmm. Don't know how much of that is PR, probably a right. fair bit of it, because the uh, the movie itself is basically about um, a maximum security rehab center in uh, Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. which uh, hosts a program that uh, where um, terrorists uh, go uh, either they've been called by the Saudi government or they've been um, released from Guantanamo right. uh, and where they are basically rehabilitated and reintegrated into society. Uh, and the movie uh, focuses on, I think, four, three or four uh, Yemeni uh, terrorists who are released from Guantanamo. Mm-hmm. And Saudi Arabia takes them and puts them in that re- uh, rehabilitation center. And then the movie charts their, um, basically charts their journey through, uh, through the program. Mm-hmm. And then in the end, when you think it's over, there is the shift of power in Saudi politics. And uh, Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS, comes to power and uh, really places emphasis on anti-terrorism or counter-terrorism. So mm. uh, the program is now co- something completely different and they won't let them leave. Right. And also they're Yemeni, so they're not really integrated into Saudi society anyway. Yeah. And like on the substance, it's a very fascinating movie. But uh, as the documentarian handiwork goes, it's a little shoddy and probably ethically a little... Um, little i don't know it's a bit of a margin case or borderline case because right. uh for example the director she speaks arabic but a lot of the um a lot of the interviews are in english which puts the the people she talks with uh the reformed terrorists uh which puts them at a severe disadvantage and also kind of infantilizes them right. and the movie also has this strange tendency to in uh quotation marks humanize them by just basically making fun of them which uh is yeah it's a bit of a it's a bit disappointing because it is a really it is a really important and a really really interesting story so so the last film i would mention in the special section that i didn't catch but the new uh jan gassman film 99 moons did you catch that one i did not but i (laughs) sorry (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the gods were not happy with that <laughs> mind the hardware uh i did not i only okay. i only uh afterwards realized that i've already seen one of his movies uh years yeah. ago wonderland? Europe. Uh, no uh, oh, was was he also one of the wonderland yeah, yeah and yeah. i think europe she loves as well so okay so right. two, well, there's, there's not that many films I, th- yeah. he doesn't, I think he is in the, because uh all of the competition section is mm-hmm. Uh, the first three works of a director yeah. then he needs to go into I, then they go into gala yeah. i guess special and for him i guess wonderland uh it would be his fourth film then if i see yeah. that correctly over yeah he, this is his fourth uh feature-length film um over here i also didn't catch it I it will that one. 
probably be out in cinemas in due course. Yes, and then uh, a bunch of other films over that uh, in this section, the special section that we'll, we'll skip over. I don't think uh, we saw any of those. No, before no, Layla's brothers. Layla's brothers. I almost forgot. Did you? You no. probably didn't manage to. I did not fit in that two over two and a half hour long movie. Oh wow! Uh, I called it at Gun. It was one of the films that didn't get any highlight coming out of Gun, Gun, but I thought it was one of the most solid films coming out of the festival. It also didn't get selected for I Iran this year for the Oscars. Mm -hmm. It certainly has a shot to to be in there. I think it's a really good uh, story about Leila and her brothers and them going through a, a, a bit of a like a financial crisis, but then also them living their lives and her needing to carry for for them um, and kind of just a big family movie where every performance is really outstanding. Mm -hmm. It's so well written and performed. It's a lot of like that everyone talks over each other, but they all have like they're not just making noise, but they yeah. like there's a lot of backstory to every character that's not on screen. And it really comes through. Uh, certainly is something to keep on your radar. If you sounds seen great. It yeah, sounds right up my alley. Uh, but but that's it for the uh, for the special section. Um, we'll get into the gala section, the biggest one. Uh, <laughs> we're talking for over an hour, but uh, we'll, We'll, we'll go through these films. I've watched most of them, um, and maybe we'll give a, give more of a brief thoughts on on those. Uh, smaller films, great to shout them out a bit more here. Uh, I think people already yeah. have them a bit more on their radar. But uh, the opening film, a bit bit disappointing, right? Yes. The swimmers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Weird mixture between refugee procedural and sports drama to the detriment of both, I would say. Yeah, I agreed there. I think it has some interesting visual choices, yeah. but then also like, why does it have these? Interesting visual visual choices. Mm -hmm. It's it's a very it's a Netflix film and it's very much a Netflix film. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's it's weird that it has become kind of a a, a a a rating thing to like kind of see what kind of vibe they're going for. Mm -hmm. And in a Swiss film, A Forgotten Man, um, about a, a diplomat who was uh, working um, or representing Switzerland during the World War uh, World War Two, working really closely, I guess next to with against that's the question adolf hitler and and um the nazi regime uh as he comes back the war is over and it's about kind of figuring out that it's in black and white uh yeah did you catch that one uh yeah. yes i uh, um i saw that i saw that previously um through a screener and right. uh I thought it was okay. Uh, I yeah. think the I think the writing is more interesting than the than the execution because mm -hmm. the writing suggests some things about Swiss involvement in World War Two that um, usually or that often goes unmentioned in oh, Swiss yeah. narrative. It's, it's fictional. It's, the, the character. I mean, is it's fictionalized. It's fictionalized with the character, is, not exactly. fictional. In a, yeah. In a I mean, he is based on on Hans Fröhlicher, who is uh, who was the Swiss ambassador to Germany, and yeah, yeah I think it. Uh, I think the most striking thing about it is that it basically suggests if the Nazis had won the war, Switzerland would have been just as ready to cooperate with them as they were to cooperate with the Allies. And yeah. I think that's a worthy statement to make. It's it's really interesting because like as as someone who's not 80 years old, you have not lived through that. So it's yeah. the narrative that has been, been put forward back then. And it's, it's a bit about that as well, where we want to end the war on the winner's side yeah. and kind of, yeah make a statement in in history of what side we were on mm -hmm. so for that it was really interesting i found it, a lot of it was just like kind of shouting matches yeah, also yeah, yeah the really shouting matches I performances really it just was a bit lackluster and it had me some of the like flashbacks that it does uh it had me, had me chuckling a bit yeah. i had to hold back my laughter because it was so over the top yeah it's the, the, like the low scale drama is better than the like high prestige we're doing it, important yeah. historical filmmaking here uh, yeah drama that falls a bit flat james gray armageddon time Ooh, yes you liked it i liked it because it. uh i'm uh, i mean it, i don't think it's my favorite james gray but mm -hmm. i uh um i like movies that seem like they're small scale and that are small scale but that also touch upon uh like longer historical arcs and this one basically yeah. uh charts america's long 20th century from like accepting pogrom refugees to reagan and the trumps and right. it does so through the story of a of a young boy trying uh to fit in and to you know dealing with his uh very dysfunctional family mm -hmm. uh and i just thought it was a um, 
it was a really good portrait of that and Anthony Hopkins gives a great supporting performance. The better supporting performance in the film. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> of the two films that he was a part of this year. Uh, yeah, um, to me, I think I, I was just, uh, I'm just, I, I've had it, I've had enough and it's already two more are coming of like the directors doing a recount of their childhood with mm. Spielberg and Sam Mendes and uh, I think, yeah, Sam Mendes also yeah. doing a Empire of Light uh, later this year. Uh, this, this, I also caught this in, in Gun. Um, and it was, uh, I think it was for me, a film that had the potential to be a bit like even better yeah. for me, but then it was held back by like reiterating certain mm. beliefs and notions that like it fe felt really conventional mm. in how it's portraying, uh, the characters that it sets up. Uh, but overall, I think it's still like a, a great, great story that spans over a, a couple of years as well. Um, New film from Luca Guadagnino. I have not seen it. You have not seen it. Well, uh, I got my short review already out because I, I did have uh, I did have that on my watch list um, in, in Venice. I was in Venice that it played. I also saw Timothy Chalamet in that crazy, crazy outfit on the red carpet. Really looked it, when he when he stepped out of the car. It was before the photos were snapped. Everyone was really just like, oh, that's. That's daring, certainly. Um, but Bones and All, I think uh, I ordered the book. It still has not arrived. I ordered it before I went to Venice. Oh, wow. So I have not read it yet. I, I would have loved to have seen it because I think the film does uh, quite a few conventional things uh, towards the end of the story where it kind of wants to tie up certain narrative bits and it just feels like overly dramatic when Guadagnino is really good at making those uh I guess, more subtle moments uh, in between where it's not like the focus to have uh, the, the plot advance. And I feel like it, the, maybe the, the book, the novel is a bit of a restriction on that, but it didn't really come together like all the way towards the end, but everything leading up to it, uh, there's some great performances from Taylor Russell and Timothy Chalamet. Uh, Mark Rylance is, is somehow a pleasant surprise in it as well. He's so odd. Some people are going to hate that. Others are going to love it. And I think it's going to be the identity of a bunch of young people. They're like going to say bones and all. That's, that's, that's so my life. I like don't eat people, but I'm so much like that. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a dark, fun story that, uh, although it is about cannibals, it's very much just the coming of age film in a way as well. Uh, Broker. Yes. yes. Caught yes. it? Caught it. Yes. At the end of a five, uh, at the end of a five movie day. So, yeah. uh, I'm looking forward to revisiting it in a bit of a more relaxed setting, but, right. uh, I liked it. It's, uh, Hirokazu Koreeda, um, I don't know offering another variation on what he did in Choplifters yeah. uh, with uh, like really literalizing the idea of found family. <laughs> this time it's a, a road movie involving human trafficking and murder. And uh, yeah, I thought it was uh, I thought it was good. I thought it was very, very wholesome. Song Gang-ho uh, really elevates, uh, elevates it to another level, I feel, yeah. because he really is one of my favorite actors at this point. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I had a... I had a really good time. I'm not like uh, an ac uh, like a an acolyte of Koreeda. I think I like him, but he's not like one of my all time favorite directors. But I am also very motivated to uh, watch more of his stuff. I think I just I I love Choplifters, and I I haven't seen it uh, like I've I've seen it quite recently. I think like a year or two ago. Uh, so not like, you know, a, a year ago and um, going into this, I, I had high expectations because mm -hmm. I was really eagerly evading it. And I think it met my expectations, even exceeded them oh, in cool. certain um, aspects. I think it's not as as great as Shoplifters, but still has uh, like a lot of charm, especially through that uh, leading performance and a lot of the supporting cast as well. I think yeah. it really works for me. It's a charming story about um, on on the page pretty much like unlikable characters that somehow mm -hmm. are very likable and, and humanized not in a way where it's just for the story, but it just kind of makes sense. Um, I, I really liked it. Uh, unfortunately, not going to be the one in the Oscar race uh, because I think it would be through uh, South Korea and they put decision to leave from Park Chun Wook. I mean, that's uh, what, a, what a decision to make. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And then I think it also couldn't go with Japan because they selected Plan 75. Uh, uh, yeah, that didn't play here. If I'm, I think it didn't play in Zurich. But I, so I caught it a con. I don't think that has a shot of getting in. Uh, but but still, I mean, go go seek out Broker when it releases. And then uh, the big big uh, LGBTQ plus uh, comedy bros. 
Did you? Uh, I you missed, missed it. it. Yes. I had a blast. I think all I think right. that's all you need to to know about the film as well. It's a blast. It's a good studio comedy. I mean, I think it it suffers from the producer credit from Judd Apatow because it overstayed its welcome about like fifteen to twenty minutes. Uh -huh. It tries to tie end stuff where it's really conventional where. The rest of the story maybe isn't not not just like the the sexuality aspect of it, but it's it's very much like subverting a bit of like while being still in the frame of of a, of a studio comedy, it still is subverting a few expectations, and it doesn't really do that towards the end. So that was a bit disappointing. Other than that, really solid uh, comedy that made me laugh out loud a couple of times. It's really like that um, belly chuckling type of stuff. I only just recently learned that uh, Guy Branham is in it and that is uh, enough for me to be uh, to put it on my list when it's out in cinemas. <laughs> well, go seek it out. Uh, let's get to my favorite film in probably three years. I've already put it up on that pedestal. That's uh, Luca Dant's uh, Dant's uh, Close. Uh, was a really big fan of it. I, I don't even want to say too much about it on my side. Uh, side, just it's great. It's visually stunning. The performances are incredible. I, I, I love uh, stories that are really sad and uh, feel like they're not just sad because they're sad, but they also have a lot to say about the characters as as they progress not just it's not about the suffering or whatever he's 13 years old uh has a friendship or maybe more than that uh with one of his classmates and i don't even want to say more than that i think it's just a visually very stunning film Where i've not seen it? it oh you haven't seen it well i have also not seen girl so um i remain in right. Uh, well, I remain uninitiated into Luc Adon. The thing is, uh, this is my first film of his. All right, and okay. I think he, he's, he's jumped up there as <laughs> one of my favorite filmmakers. I think it was incredible. Yeah, I just really connected with it. Um, and if you can stomach a a heavy film, I think it's really worth it. It's. I think it's the like. I gave five stars it. to Crimes of the Future. I think I'm fine. <laughs> 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 heavy in the in a different way but i don't mind the heaviness so yeah i will yeah. seek it out when it's uh when it's out in cinemas i hope Definitely it comes out do that yeah i think i think it does have a release date it's with uh if it's with film copy here in switzerland it's getting a release i think All later right, in the good. year uh and then uh corsage with vicky creeps i think just also not seen great character piece that's all i'll say great performance by her she plays uh the austrian duchess i think yeah duchess that's right. Uh, great performance. Um, it's coming into theaters quite soon. And then uh, Daliland. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's just, I think it's just Ezra Miller was in this movie. That's my whole review. It's like, okay. It's yeah, Ezra one. Miller is in, and they're in it for like, I don't know, three scenes. And it's, uh, it, it really makes me think that this was an entirely different movie at some point. And then it got re-edited to what it is now. And what it is yeah. is basically like, mush because it's just it's like it's structured like a hollywood biopic but not so much about dali but about the person who becomes his uh, who becomes his assistant yeah. and it doesn't really make sense and it also doesn't really engage with anything that makes dali interesting or uh problematic or i don't know visionary or whatever ad adjective you could come up with so in the end it's just bit of a wash yeah i think he's just like a flamboyant character yeah. and he's just like that quote-unquote flamboyant but he doesn't really have any yeah. character that uh we both didn't catch i think their nachname uh we know i heard very bad things about it so i think i'm fine with that um and i think uh, the golden years the golden and is already in theaters uh and dreaming wild also no. caught i want i wanted to catch that because i like love and mercy by bill Pollard. Uh, I, I think this one is is again a film that that stays uh, on. I think that's just like such a common critique, but it, it overstays its welcome a bit a bit too much. But it's about this uh, uh, this musician who never really quite got the break, and then uh, 20, 25 years after the fact, it gets gets picked up, gets some traction on the internet, and it's maybe a second uh, success story. Or do we even want that? And uh, it's it's very much like a, a story about the family as well, uh, their support and how that impacted them, and uh, about lost opportunities. It has a lot of themes, a lot of uh, good music in it as well. I think it's charming. It's a sweet film, um, but uh, something that's I think gonna fly under the radar for a lot of people. But I mean, like, much like Love and Mercy did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which I hope it's not going to happen for this next film. Uh, <laughs> personally praised by the, the artistic director of the festival, Gigi and Nate. 
<laughs> film about a monkey oh, and a paralyzed um, uh, teenager as they form a friendship. And uh, yeah, we, we caught, I think this is one of the few things we, yeah. we caught uh, with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly a movie. <laughs> it is apparently a movie. Yeah. Uh, I uh, I will always fondly remember you coming out of this movie and you saying uh, how much you want to bet the director of this was a 65 year old white Republican and uh, it turns out the director is 64 years old as you told me so uh, at least 50% right um, yeah yeah so, yeah it's uh, my god it's uh, probably the closest you will get to like uh, in <clears throat> or you would have gotten in Switzerland to seeing one of those uh, pandering uh, American productions that are really geared towards uh, affluent conservative yeah. uh, white suburbanites mm -hmm. uh, and that probably never open anywhere else. So Yeah, it's exactly yeah. that. Uh, it's like pure flicks without God. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, anyways, I think, I think to me, a highlight was All Quiet on the Western Front. Just mm -hmm. a great cinematic experience. Maybe catch it before it releases yeah, on Netflix. Does it's, it come out in cinemas as well? I I, I hope it does. Yeah, you um, would hope so, yeah. Yeah, there, there, was, there was no real... Um, I think they don't have a distributor. Sometimes the Netflix mm -hmm. films do get a Swiss distributor. Uh, I think that's not the case here, so we'll have to wait and see but but yeah it's it's very much um a, a worthy adaptation of yeah. the remark uh novel um it's really great in its visuals in its devastating um uh, just performances and how morbid it all is uh it doesn't hold back and um yeah i, th I th think it, it really adapts the novel quite well i haven't seen the original uh, so uh neither have i I have some issues with it, but generally I can uh, I can co-sign the the praise. Also, yeah. I mean, for most people, it will probably evoke uh, Sam Mendes' 1917. I think I prefer yeah. All Quiet uh, on the Western Front to 1917. Yeah, also, because it um, to me it really drives home the point how pointless World War One was yeah. in in a sense, uh, in a more uh, sustained or in a more and in a more uh, satisfying way than 1917 did. And as you said, the visuals are great. The yeah, I, I really like most of the actors. I think uh, sometimes they struggle a bit in the capital B big emotional scenes where I think the movie is kind of hammering home that it is adapting great world literature a little bit too much but yeah. uh generally i i did really appreciate the film and yeah i think i think we we have to rattle through a few of those because i think we're running out of time um but uh what did you make of the eight mountains uh i liked it it um confirmed for me that uh um felix van groningen uh is a bit uh, is weak is better at setting up his stories than he is at concluding them right so i think the first two hours of this two and a half hour movie work better than the final half hour but mm -hmm. i still i i still uh quite liked it because it was a very low-key um portrait of men changing with their circumstances and i i like that yeah i agree there i, I think uh, i i caught it at Ghana to premiere mm. and i was like in my suit and whatever all dressed <laughs> up but i was so tired that first mm. day and at some point these two characters meshed into one for me yeah. uh so it was a bit hard to to keep track of it because i, I might have dozed off one or two times i, I didn't get a chance to re-watch it but I think it's it's visually also really yeah. uh, stunning in the four by three aspect ratio, yes. kind of emphasizing on the height of the mountains, and um, yeah, it's it's really told in silences as well the whole yeah. film, uh, which is confidently directed as well. I don't know if it works all the time, if it might be a bit like too too long or mm. it gets a bit uh, too slow for some people. Um, but I think I'm rethinking my, and I think I gave it like a five out of ten, mm -hmm. which I think is a bit low for it. I think it deserves a bit more, uh, which is maybe not in the best mood. Uh, it happens at it festivals. Ha it happens sometimes, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, other people's children. The song for the Zotre. I did not catch that. I think France has has a good year when it comes to those films. There's also one uh, on Bon Matin uh, from Mia Hansen. Love, but no, there's there's a bunch of uh, great French films. I think also playing at at the festival. Uh, there was the the Innocent that I quite enjoyed. Did you? Did not see. That's one that gets my recommendations. Pretty much all of the uh, French films. Uh, Les Enfants des Autres and uh, Bon Matin. I think they were all really solid. Um, 
films that I can recommend. Um, ha have you seen the uh, Akira Kurosawa Ikiru film? Unfortunately, yeah. not. I have to. I've had the DVD for years. I'm gonna right. watch it soon. <laughs> so I assume, did you catch then the British remake of it? Uh, I don't think so. What? Which one was it? Living. That's... No, no, no. I didn't. I caught that one. I think it's. I already talked about it when we talked about Venice. So I won't go into it here, but. Uh, Kira is, is a masterpiece, so it's easy to adapt from a masterpiece to not make a garbage film, so it's quite a good <laughs> film. One film that won, the, the, I think, the jury prize or something like that in, in Venice, No Bears. Did you manage to see no, that? No, unfortunately, no. And I am a big Jaffer Panay fan, so... Right. Well, I've seen one film, and I'm not. <laughs> I wasn't a fan of this one, but maybe I need to maybe I need to rewatch it. Uh, but You uh, should watch This Is Not A Film or Taxi. Yeah, I was just I I didn't know anything going in, and mm -hmm. then I, I think I I needed the the mental preparedness of of what what a movie of his entails. Um, another highlight, uh, Banshees of Inner Sheeran. I'm seeing that tonight. Well, okay, then I won't say too much. I think it's already gotten um some praise out of other festivals. I think it's a it's the best picture front runner. It's on the radar for a lot of people, so we can just say it, for me at least, it's a, it's a great film. Might be. Uh, Martin McDonough's best film oh, wow. um, to, okay. to me to date. Uh, the Menu, you caught it. I right? did. Uh, lots of praise beforehand. I'm not as effusive, but I still I still had a very good time. Yeah. It kind of is in that uh, sub in that eat the rich sub genre, along with like Knives Out and Ready or Not. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's as good as either of those two movies, but uh, it's you know it's it's fun it uh, has a good laugh has, has a lot of good laughs um i hope it makes money at the, at the box office because it's the kind of uh like i'm going to say call it mid budget original filmmaking i don't actually know if it is mid budget but it like feels like the kind of mid budget movies that we yeah. don't get as much of anymore so yeah. it's it was I, I think it was refreshing to see modest size and scope that is still like can create uh, can create something that is so evocative. Yeah, I think the the eat the rich thing is is a theme that we're gonna see yeah. more and more. We we've gotten away from uh, a bit more of the maybe COVID years mm -hmm. one or two. We, we get more of uh, I guess the more uh, anti capitalist mm -hmm. eat, eat the rich film, which which I mean is a fun satire. Yeah, uh, it's not the only one that played at the festival. Uh, maybe to you the more successful one. Mm -hmm. But what did you make of Triangle of Sadness? I just. I mean, I liked it better than the other Ursuline I've seen, The Square. Yeah. Um, I think it's funnier, Triangle of Sadness, but uh, ultimately still didn't deliver enough for me to warrant being two and a half hours long and making ultimately what I thought were fairly basic points. So right. Like, rich people are uh, vapid and shallow. It's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, for those points, I think if, if it's like all, only on the satirical level of trying to make a point, I, I don't know how, how far down it goes, how deep <laughs> it is. But I just found it really uh, just um, entertaining, mm -hmm. and that carried the whole way right, fair enough, for me. Yeah. So I had quite a good time, um, and and yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's a film that uh, we're going. People are mostly going to, I think, easily uh, jump onto yeah. the dragon on and enjoy, uh, which. I think it was something that I was I was hoping for, uh, like a success story, a, a sequel of sorts for um, Florian Zeller's uh, the <laughs> the father, and we got the son, and we unfortunately, did. it really you know fall, fell flat a bit. Yeah, extremely um, so. I don't know if there's much else to say about like if you've you've been a bit a part of the discourse and you've already heard it. Uh, it's the adaptation. Might be a bit weak. Some of the performances really don't don't land. It just is quite bland, which is weird after you get like to me almost like a, a really uh, um, a film for the ages with the father. It feels to me like timeless. The great Anthony Hopkins performance, and here you just get something that just feels like a muddled mess that doesn't really have anything to say and makes some points that like portrays uh, depression in really a a silly childish way yeah. as well. I personally, I felt that uh, the father was also not as um, deep as a lot of people were making it out to be, but I still, I, I enjoyed it. I thought the, um, like the narrative and visual trickery and Anthony Hopkins' performance uh, were great. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the son, yeah, it's it just kind of felt like, okay, so now we are stripping away the trickery and what is left is, as you say, like really unremarkable and quite superficial dealing with human emotions and yeah, yeah it didn't, 
really didn't land for me. I, I remain hopeful for the mother, though. Uh, the third in the trilogy. I think he's, he can still direct a really great film. It, it was just a bit of a misstep here. And then lastly, I think from this all the time we got for the gala section, uh, did you catch The Good Nurse? I did. Yeah. Uh, Netflix film. Yeah, again. Yes. Uh, thought it was was fine i mm -hmm. i'm unconvinced by the performances from jessica chastain and eddie redmayne but uh i think the movie pushed through that by virtue of being uh like kind of a little bit of a sleazy paperback thriller and yeah. to give the sleazy paperback thriller treatment to a horrific true story of like <laughs> yes. a, a murder essentially yeah. uh I thought was a bold move, and I think it's it it works as the as the thriller that it is. And yeah, it definitely works within that. Just don't peek outside of yeah. what the actual implications of it are. It's, it's a bit weird when you try to, I guess, make it thrilling when it, it is mm. about uh, someone who's done horrific things. Yeah. So it's like it's, it's that's a bit hard. But I think that's all from the gala section. There's, there's a few more that uh, we watched, uh, at least uh, that I'm confident that I watched. Didn't get into. Um, well. Post uh, well, I'll be posting uh, a, a kind of a watch list of all the things I saw in a, in the tier list form um, in an upcoming day where I will have all the films in here. But uh, lastly, there's there's a few of the the smallest sections. Uh, the hashtag religion, worldview, Spain, and borderlines. Uh, was there any film that that stood out to you uh, from there? Uh, yes. So, uh, Fire of Love mm -hmm. uh, by Sarah Dosa in the in the religion section. Uh, not a fantastic movie because I think it re really is undercut by the fact that it has a bit of a overly twee voiceover. But it right. is the story of uh, Katja and Maurice Kraft, a French volcanologist couple who died in the nineties uh, in a volcanic eruption and who dedicated their lives to documenting volcanoes. The movie's great strength is that it just really uh, goes all out on uh, showing the uh, the footage that the two uh, that the two recorded, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm also uh, jumping off from that movie. I am very interested in uh, watching very soon the new Van Herzog movie, The Fire Within, which is also about the crafts and yeah. uh, which people say is a very interesting pairing with the uh, with Fire of Love. So, although just for you know continuing my own Van Herzog project, I have to see Fire of Love. So you do, uh, yeah, you do have I, to finish I, the whole. Are you almost through the entire filmography? At this uh, point? I have seen Herzog's entire filmography, oh, but okay. then he went and made two movies in 2022 that I've yet to see. Oh, so right. one of them is The Fire Within, and which I will watch very soon because it just uh, it was on regular old TV on Arte. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, it's a bit harder to find then, I guess, maybe. Uh, there, there were two films that I saw out of this section, Hunk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. Um, mm -hmm. Funny film that I think uh, gets a bit meta with the, the mockumentary type of style that it's doing. Uh, I think it's entertaining, worth checking out. Uh, and then Boy From Heaven, I uh, did an interview with the uh, director that I'll... No, I can't link it here yet because the film is not out yet. So you see that later day when it gets to the release date. But uh, that was a really interesting thriller uh, that I can recommend um, about uh, the Cairo Institution um, Al Azar, I think is what it's called. I'll have to correct myself if I'm wrong there. But um, yeah, a really interesting thriller. But but that's it for for the the religion section for me. And then in uh, for Spain, uh, I only caught on the fringe, but that was back in Venice as well. Uh, Penelope Cruz, um, and it's 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 uh, someone who's constantly on the fringe. <laughs> I guess it's it is that kind of. Uh, Thriller where everyone everyone needs to move at all times. It's about uh, I guess a bit of uh, like the housing crisis as well. Uh, peeping people being evicted. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's quite a solid film uh, out of Spain. But it's a huge section over here in the world view Spain, and I'm quite disappointed that I didn't get to catch uh, more uh, of them. Uh, but I, I don't know. Do you have? I saw on? Alcaraz, the mm -hmm. uh, the I winner of Berlin. Yeah, um, yeah. Thought it was fine. A bit formless and not that interested in um, you know speaking to anyone that is not <clears throat> familiar with the kind of struggle that uh, the film depicts about um, farmers in uh, in rural Spain but I also have to say I do respect it for that that it mm. chooses and really goes for that specificity so it's like not my favorite movie but I um I appreciated it right and then uh, out of borderlines the only thing I saw was back at Sundance midwives did an interview with the director there uh, again um 
link to that, but <laughs> so much to link to. Uh, but yeah, I didn't catch anything else. Uh, that's an interesting one, but... Um, I saw uh, Patricio Guzman's uh, Mi País Imaginario or My Imaginary Country about the yeah. protest movement in Chile uh, and the ensuing uh, process to reform the, uh, the constitution. Mm-hmm. Uh, by Patricia Guzman standards, who uh, is really good with uh, associative documentary uh, storytelling, so like Nostalgia for the Light or uh, The Pearl Button um, are great examples of that. And this one is disappointingly straightforward, uh, basically just, you know, talking heads of people from the protest movement. Right. Uh, what it does have going for it is very uh, striking, intense on the ground footage of the mm. protests and uh, kind of an outlook that doesn't feel the need to justify its own leftist position. It mm. just kind of defines uh, its own politics on positive terms and says, this is what we stand for. And we just assume or we just say these are good things and we're just going to roll with that and i thought that was that was quite good even if the the whole like storytelling could have been a bit more expansive and a bit more associative also because chile has that history of um protest and dictatorship and leftist resistance that Guzman also only slightly touches on. Well, I think that's all of the things we'll talk about today. This was a longer session than expected, but we did get to touch on pretty much all a lot of the films that we watched. Uh, the rainy days here in Zurich <laughs> are over. It was a really rainy festival, yeah. but you could say perfect cinema uh, weather. But yeah, I think uh, Zurich with its 18th iteration is really establishing its place in the European um, film festival circuit uh, as a highlight festival, um, picking stuff sometimes from Sundance a bit, but mainly from Cannes and Venice, uh, so a great highlight. For me, at least, it was great because I went in having seen about 25 films already. Yeah. That made it really chill. I would <laughs> love to do that again. My bank account would say something different. But uh, yeah, really four festival uh, out of great films, hopefully uh, a lot of films that you can put onto your watch list. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much, Alan, for coming on again. Uh, thank we'll you for having you me. In the next 365 days, we'll be <laughs> <Definitely>. back here <laughs> to talk again about uh, the festival. Um, now, do you have anything to shout out? Where can uh, people find you? Yes, uh, you can uh, check out my writing on maximumcinema.ch and facingthebittertruth.com. Uh, there I'm also linking uh, my podcast appearances uh, both here and on Maximum Cinema and my articles that appear elsewhere such as on Swiss Info and you can follow me on Twitter at Alan Motley. Sweet, perfect. And you can follow everything quite on set. Link below is the link tree to everything. Uh, subscribe and like if you haven't already. And uh, yeah, we'll be back soon. Uh, not with Alan, unfortunately. You'll have to wait another year for that. Maybe, maybe we got some other things in the works where he'll be back. But uh, yeah, back with Lachlan next week. And uh, we'll see you Monday. Monday.